a general custom uh, to speak uh, in a meeting such as this or whenever I preach, apart from expounding the Word of God. But I feel that tonight we are met on such a special and unique occasion that I may be permitted a few words before I come to call your attention to the particular verse which I want to consider with you. I simply want to say that I am here tonight with very great pleasure. Indeed, I regard it as a very great privilege. I've known these two men, whom I regard as brothers uh, and as dear friends, not only for the 25 years that they've been in the ministry, but before that, I knew them as students. Mr. Swan has been telling you of how they had to fight for their faith in the college that was supposed to be teaching them and grounding them in the faith. But it was quite clear to me from the moment that I met them that these were two men who knew their God and on whom the hand of God had been set quite firmly. And it was a joy to watch them then as students and still more after they entered the ministry. And it has given me great joy and encouragement, being an older man than they are, to see them coming along and fighting the good fight of faith and standing for the only things that ultimately matter in these evil days in which we find ourselves. Well, I just wanted to say that, that I thank God for them and their lives and their ministries. And I'm sure that I'm expressing the feeling of all visitors here tonight when I say that our prayer is that God will increase the pressure of his hand upon them and use them in a yet more striking and signal manner in the years that lie ahead. Well now, it seemed to me that the best thing we could do tonight and the most profitable thing would be to consider together the nature of the Christian ministry. And I want to do so through calling your attention to the chapter that my friend Mr. DuPont, and let me say it's always a joy to be with him and with my other friend Mr. Peter Golding on any occasion. We come together quite often in various ways. Now I ask Mr. DuPont to read the fourth chapter of the second epistle to the Corinthians because I wanted you to have the full setting and context of verse number five, the fifth verse. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, or Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. This section of this second epistle to the Corinthians is peculiar in one respect, and that in it, not only this chapter, but the previous chapters, the great apostle refers a good deal to himself. Now, that was very unusual with the apostle Paul. As he says, I preach not myself. And he very rarely makes references to himself. Unlike so many today who always seem to be talking about themselves, Paul very rarely does so. And when he does so, he generally has a reason for doing so. And here the reason was quite plain. We find it difficult to believe this, don't we? But there were many people in the church at Corinth who didn't appreciate the Apostle Paul. They were highly critical of him. Some of them had even been dismissing him. They'd said his presence is weak. Paul was nothing to look at. We understand that he was a short man, bald-headed and with a beaked nose, quite the opposite of a film star. They said his presence is weak, and his speech, they said, is contemptible. So they were criticizing him, his personal appearance, his manner of speaking, his message, everything else. And they were completely taken in by men whom he describes as false apostles, false brethren. There were such people even in the early church. There's nothing new about that. The church, the true church has had to fight for her life from the very beginning and in these early days. 
as you can read in the third chapter and other parts of this epistle, there were men going round the churches and were very popular. They'd set themselves up, God had never called them, and they were writing letters of commendation and recommendation, the one to the other, and so they were having a highly successful time. And they were all criticizing the Apostle Paul and even doubting whether he had the right to call himself an apostle at all and criticizing his message. Well, now then, in a sense, it's a good thing for us that they did so because it was in replying to them and defending his right to be an apostle that Paul wrote this second epistle to the Corinthians. And in this, you see, he does a number of things. And that's why I'm calling your attention to it. He shows them the real character of a Christian preacher. And at the same time, he shows the true Christian message. So this is not something that applies only to ministers. It's equally important for every member of the Christian church. Paul had been greatly troubled by these people. He says, without were fightings, within were fears. He was a sensitive man, and he was hurt by these people, and his ministry was hindered. So not only has the man in the pulpit to know the nature of the ministry and the real character of the Christian message, it's equally important that every Christian church member should be equally aware of this so that what I'm going to show you now is applicable not only to preachers but also to every member of the church. Paul here describes his own ministry. This is, after all, the standard of the Christian minister, the Christian ministry, and Christian preaching. And that's why I'm so happy to be here tonight. It is because our two friends conform to this pattern that we thank God for them and shall go on to pray for their future. Now then, let's look at it like this. Paul puts it in a very odd way. He says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. What's he mean by this? Well, he's comparing and contrasting himself, as I've indicated, with those false apostles, those men who set themselves up as preachers and as apostles. And what he's really saying is that they were preaching themselves, and not really preaching the gospel. The true preacher does not preach himself, but he preaches the gospel and its message. Now, there are many ways in which a man can preach himself. And it's unfortunately the truth to say that in the modern world, as in the ancient world, superficially looking at affairs, the more a man preaches himself, the more popular he is likely to be. What do you mean, says someone, by preaching himself? Well, there are many ways in which men can do this and are doing it. There are men who really are simply propagating themselves and presenting themselves. You can see it in their very appearance, the attention they pay to personal appearance in dress and the wave in the hair and so many other things. They're presenting their own personalities deliberately, plastering their own photographs about, advertising themselves, and always calling attention in some way or another to themselves. There's a great deal of this at the present time. The cult of personality. And people are ready to follow such people in crowds. Hitler had the cult of personality. So unfortunately have many men who occupy Christian pulpits or who conduct big Christian meetings. They deliberately are presenting themselves and their own personalities in different ways. But that's not the only way. I'm not going to weary you with this. But it's important we should realize this. There are many men who are not preaching the gospel, but preaching their own ideas. This is why the churches are as they are today, speaking generally. 
That's why these men are to endure what they did in their theological colleges. Philosophy instead of the Bible message. A man can preach himself by showing his learning, his great knowledge of Greek and of Hebrew, always quoting it and people say, what a learned man. That's preaching yourself. You're calling your attention to your own knowledge and to your own learning and to your own understanding rather than to the truth. And in the same way, such men and others often report, they say it's done to the glory of God, but they're always reporting the results and so on and so forth. Well now, there are many ways in which you see men can preach and present themselves. They're out for a personal following. And it's not a difficult thing to do. They get a personal following and they appear to be highly successful in the immediate and for the time being. Now the apostle says he doesn't do that. He's renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. He's not walking in craftiness. He's not handling the word of God deceitfully. But he says by manifestation of the truth presenting ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Very well. Now I want to ask one big question which I'm going to try to answer. Why didn't the Apostle Paul preach himself like these others were doing then and like so many are doing at the present time? Why didn't he do that? And he gives us the answer, the answers himself in this very passage that we are considering together. The first reason why Paul didn't preach himself was that he was not worth preaching. He wasn't a fit subject for preaching. Why not? Well, this is a thing that's so characteristic of Paul. The Apostle Paul never forgot that he was once Saul of Tarsus. He never forgot it. It followed him through his life. There he was. What was he? He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of Christ and the Christian faith. He was an injurious person. That's what he was. And he would have continued like that were it not that the risen Lord had dealt with him and had apprehended him. He says, I'm not preaching myself because I myself was Saul of Tarsus, a man who was absolutely blind to all these things, entirely unworthy. And I say, therefore, that that was sufficient reason in and of himself. Paul says of himself, I am what I am by the grace of God. Well, therefore, I have nothing to boast of. I was all wrong and would have remained all wrong. All that I am is due to him. So I don't talk about myself. I'm ashamed of that. I talk about him and about him alone. He says, we have received this ministry. He's never tired of saying this. There he was, you remember. He'd gone to the authorities in Jerusalem asking for authority to go down to a place called Damascus to exterminate a little group of people known as Christians in a Christian church. And he was so furious against Christianity that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, anticipating massacring these people. That was the man and he'd have gone on. But then he suddenly had this great experience on the road to Damascus and he turned him right round and he became a preacher of the gospel. So he, is make, he makes it quite clear to us that he is a Christian, not because of anything in himself. It's all the grace of God. He's a teacher and a preacher. He has an understanding of the message. Why? Not because of his cleverness, not because of his scholarship, not because of his learning. He was all that. He was a genius. He was an exceptionally able man. But he keeps on telling us, I have received of the Lord. Unlike the moderns, the modernists, the liberals and many others, he never said that he'd arrived at a knowledge of truth by much reading and studying and arguing and learning. And at last he'd found it. The exact opposite. 
He was violently against it. And he had to be literally knocked down to the ground on the road to Damascus and blinded. And then his eyes opened and his spiritual eyes were opened. And he was given an understanding of this blessed and glorious truth. So he says, I can't preach myself. It is nonsense. It's monstrous. All has come to me. I've received it all. A dispensation of the gospel has been delivered unto me. And then he gives us one other reason here under this same heading for not preaching himself. Why he's an unworthy subject of his own preaching. And that is, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What do you mean? Well, he goes on explaining it. Death worketh in us, but life in you. Man at his best is a very frail creature. He is a passing creature. We are earthen vessels. We are all getting older. We become feeble. Not only that, the history of the church tells us that great men have become heretics in spite of their ability and learning and in spite of their experiences. They've gone astray. That's why Paul says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's why he says, lest I having preached to others should myself become a castaway. That's the Apostle Paul, a humble man who realized the frailty of human nature. Whatever gifts we have, how small they are, how frail they are, how they tend to fail and they win and a time comes when we go, we die, we disappear and the world forgets all about us. We are earthen vessels. That's no subject for a man to preach about, says Paul. So I don't preach myself. Now that's his first reason. He wasn't a worthy subject of preaching because of these things. But let me go on to something still more important. He doesn't preach himself because he knew that he was totally inadequate in and of himself to deal with the problem confronting the Christian preacher. Now this is very important. Paul says, I don't preach myself. Why? Well, I know that I myself, as I am, am hopelessly inadequate to deal with the task and the problem confronting the Christian preacher. What is that? Now this is where you see it's important that we should all realize this. Not only preachers, but also members of churches. These foolish people in Corinth, they never had a real conception of the task of the preacher, the evangelist. They never saw it. What is the task of the evangelist? Well, the apostle tells us here quite plainly. Let me show you some of the terms which he uses. He says, if our gospel be hid, if there are people who don't believe it and who don't see it, it is it to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Then in verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Very well. What is the task of the gospel? What's our problem? What are we dealing with? Well, we preach to a world that is outside. We preach to members who belong to the world outside who come into our services. What is the state and the condition of the natural man? What is the state and the condition of everybody in the world tonight who is not a Christian? Now this is the great question and I feel it's absolutely vital to the lives of our churches. I believe that our failure today and our, the absence of true revival is largely due to the fact that as Christians speaking generally we fail to realize the enormous character of the problem confronting us, the state of men and women 
who are not Christian. What is it? Well, now the danger is that we just think of them as men and women who do certain things. Drink, take drugs, live for pleasure, like reading pornography, and so on and so forth. Indulge in abnormal sex and so on. We tend to think of the non-Christian solely in terms of his conduct and his behavior. And so the tendency is to think of Christianity as a teaching of morality, of conduct and of behavior. There are, alas, many people inside the church as well as outside who really regard the church and our mission as a kind of negative process, pr protest against immorality and vice and wrong that the Christian preacher is here to denounce drunkenness, immorality, vice, separation, divorce, drug taking and so on and so forth. And that's all. And if these people simply stop doing that, all would be well. Now that's an utter travesty of the message of the Christian gospel in its understanding of the state of the world. All that is true of the world. But the vital question is this. Why does the world live like that? Why is the world like that? And the apostle gives us the answer. It is, he says, in a state of darkness. This is his comparison. He says, what's happened to me is comparable to what happened at the creation of the world. You read about it in Genesis 1. There was a gross darkness and the Spirit of God brooded over the vast deep. Darkness. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Creation comes into being. He says, that's the comparison. The trouble with a man who's not a Christian is not simply that he's living in a wrong way. His real trouble is that he's in a state of utter darkness, gross darkness, with regard to the essence of man and of a human being. This is their real trouble. You can, by various means, reform morals. It's often happened in the history of the world. But that's not our problem. Our problem is this, that men and women are totally ignorant. Now, Paul keeps on saying this kind of thing in his various epistles. Listen to him saying it in the epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Listen, listen to this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. How do they walk? In the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to walk, to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's their condition. Or as he puts it elsewhere, they are dead in trespasses and sins. The man who is not a Christian is ignorant. It's a gross darkness. And he's ignorant of the most important things of all. He's ignorant of the fact that he has a soul. He never thinks of that. He thinks of man as a, an animal, whose cerebrum is more highly developed than that of most animals. But he really believes he's in this world to eat and drink, indulge his sex, make money and have a good time. That's his view of life. He knows nothing about the fact that he's got a soul, that he was meant to be a companion of God. He never faces the fact of death, still less the fact that there is a judgment beyond death and that his eternal destiny is determined by what he does in this life and in this world. They're totally ignorant of this. It's not merely their behavior. It is their spiritual deadness. They are dead in trespasses and sins. Or as Paul puts it elsewhere, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. It doesn't matter whether he's the ablest philosopher or scientist in the country tonight. He's blind spiritually. He may have great learning, great knowledge, but he's ignorant of the fact that he's a living soul, a spiritual being, 
and that is meant for communion and fellowship with God. That's our problem. Not simply to persuade people to live a better life, but to enlighten their darkness, to give them spiritual understanding. No man can possibly do it. Even the Apostle Paul couldn't do it. So he doesn't preach himself. But wait a minute, that's not the whole of our problem. It's not merely that men, men by nature, are ignorant and in a state of darkness. They are being dominated by the God of this world. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest, in order that they may not, believe the glorious gospel of Christ. My friends, we are not merely concerned with human ignorance. There's something much more terrible at the back of it. Why are men and women in this darkness? Why is our world as it is tonight? Why are men preparing for the Third World War in this present century? Why is there this problem of pornography, permissiveness, and all the breakdown of morals? Why is our world as it is at this minute? Paul says the answer is this, it is under the control of the devil. It's not merely men. Again, remember how he puts it in Ephesians 2. You, he says, as he quickened, were dead in trespasses and sins, in whom, he says, we all had our conversation, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's why the world is as it is. The course of this world. Well, how are people living as everybody else is living? What's determining how people live? What they see on the television and the wireless. What they read in the newspapers. What they heard, hear, hear other people saying. The course of this world. Well, who determines that? Men? No. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It's the devil the God of this world. Now, if we don't understand this, we don't understand the problem. If we merely think the task is one of immorality, we are missing the whole point. This is the problem. How are we to get men and women out of this tyranny and bondage of the devil? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, says Paul. The problem is not to persuade men intellectually. We are not up against men. Paul was more than equal to any man alive. What do we wrestle against? Principalities and powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. Christian people, are you aware of this? These people in Corinth were not. That's why they were criticizing this great man who was aware of it. They wanted philosophy. They wanted learning. And these false apostles were giving them that. That doesn't affect, to the slightest extent, men and women who are slaves of Satan. There are men and women who pass through Oxford and Cambridge, Harvard and Yale in America and all the greatest universities of the world, who are leaders in drug, drug addiction, alcoholism and all these other foul things that are disgracing life today. It's the God of this world the prince of the power of the air. And our task is to deliver people out of his clutches. Can we do it? Can any man do it? Is any man's ability as a speaker or as a philosopher or anything else of the slightest value against the devil? Well, the answer is this. Adam and Eve were perfect, but the devil got them down, and the greatest intellects the world has ever known have all become the slaves of the devil. Very well, says Paul, I don't preach myself, because that is the problem. And then he adds even to that, and it is this, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. This is a most terrible thing, and that is why I say there is no place in the universe that is so terrible in its responsibility as a pulpit such as this. Who are we preaching to? 
we are preaching to men and women who by nature are lost. What's that mean? Well, it means what I've been saying, that they're ignorant, that they're the slaves of the devil. But it means something much more terrifying. It means that when they come to die, they're going on to face God in the judgment and to be condemned to an eternity of misery and wretchedness and shame and useless, endless remorse. They are lost. They are outside the life of God and they'll spend their eternity outside the life of God. It's bad enough in this world. This world is a living hell now, but it's nothing to what hell itself is. And the lost are people who are going to that eternal destiny of hell and of torment and of utter hopelessness. That's my task, says Paul. Am I to preach and to propagate myself and to promote and to present myself when men and women's eternal destiny depends upon the message that I preach to them. I don't preach myself. You know, he keeps on saying this. Listen to how he's already put it in chapter 2. Now, thanks be unto God, he says, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto death, to the other the savour of life unto life. And then he asks his famous question, who is sufficient for these things? Little men as I am, am I the man who in my own knowledge and learning and strength can decide whether people are going to heaven or to hell? Am I capable of saving people from hell and seeing that they go to heaven? In the next chapter he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of things done in the body whether good or bad. Therefore knowing the terror of the Lord I persuade men. Christian people, are you aware of the problem? There are many men calling themselves Christian preachers today who have never seen it. That's why they're emphasizing politics and social affairs now. That's why they're simply protesting against communism and against various other matters and are not preaching the gospel. They've never seen the problem. And that is that men and women are lost outside the life of God and are going to a lost eternity with no hope at all. Who is sufficient for these things? I'm not, says Paul, and therefore I don't preach myself. But let me come to my last and which is Paul's greatest reason of all for not preaching himself. What's that? Well, it is, of course, the glorious message that he'd received and which had been committed and delivered unto him. And this, of course, is the ultimate reason why any man who's a true preacher of the gospel cannot possibly preach himself. This is the tragedy of men who are always calling attention to themselves and their methods and this, that and the other and their own learning and get their own personal following. They've never seen this message that is in this book and that is committed to every true preacher of the gospel. The glory of the message. Did you notice the terms? Have you ever noticed it when you read this passage? Do you always notice it? Listen to this. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest what? The light of the glorious gospel. The gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts, what for? To give the light of the knowledge of what? Of philosophy, or science, 
or politics or sociology or morality. No, no. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Have you noticed the terms? Glory, particularly glory. Glorious gospel, the glory of God. What else? Gospel, what's that? Good news. To denounce the drug addict and the alcoholic and the pornographer, that's not good news. But the gospel is good news. It's the only good news in the world tonight. Do you find any good news in your newspapers? Is there any good news in any sense at the moment? There is none at all. It is profound pessimism. The only good news in the world tonight is this message. Are we aware of it, Christian people? What other term does he use? Treasure. We have this treasure. Is preaching a bit of morality and good behavior a treasure? This is one of the most priceless things in the universe. It's beyond any computation or estimate. It's a treasure. The most priceless thing in the whole cosmos. And then the other word, the excellency of the power. The glory of this power. It's excellency. I'm here tonight, my friends, to make this statement to you. Our churches are as they are tonight because we've never really seen the glory, the excellency, the magnificence, the gospel which is committed to us. We've never realized what a treasure it is. And let me just give you some headings which I plead with you to think and to work out for yourselves after you go home and for the rest of your lives. You know what we are missing is the glory. Why are the masses of the people outside our churches? In this area and in every other country in the world. Why are they outside? I can tell you. They regard us as little people. Ignorant, miserable little people. They think of us often as people who have never read and never really thought. We don't know what life is. They think we are living a life of fear. Good, decent, moral, of course, but self-contained, self-righteous, and not really happy. Our attendance at our services proves that we're not really happy. Do we give the impression that we're thrilled by it? Do we give the impression that we've got the most glorious thing in the universe? Do we give the impression we've got a treasure? Do we know anything about the excellency of the power? Do we give an impression of a glory that is indescribable? That's why people are not attending. It isn't merely the preaching. It is the members of the church. We have somehow given people the impression that Christianity is something small and despicable. And they regard themselves as liberating themselves when they stop attending a place of worship, stop reading their Bible, stop believing in God. Our responsibility is tremendous. So we must come back and try to grasp what Paul tells us here. This is why he didn't preach himself. How could a man who has once seen the glory of this message ever preach or call attention to himself and his miserable passing little gifts? Well, what is this glory, you say? Well, let me give you my headings. First and foremost, it is the glory of the blessed Holy Trinity. The three persons in the blessed Holy Trinity are involved in this message. They've planned it. They've sent it to the world. They bring it about. It is theirs and it is theirs alone. Now our fathers, you know, going back many centuries particularly, they used to talk about a great council in eternity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the three persons in the Blessed Holy Trinity. And they used to say that they met in council to consider what could be done with fallen man. God being omniscient, he saw that the fall was coming. And so they met together to consider how man could be redeemed from his ignorance, his darkness, his blindness, his slavery to the devil, and the fact that he was facing death and hell. 
and there they planned the way of salvation. And so the three persons take part in this great message, this gospel. First and foremost, the glory of the Father, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of what? The glory of God. What is the gospel? What's the message? That I can feel happy, that I can have my body healed, that I can have certain experiences. It includes all that, but it doesn't stop at that. That's why this idea that what people need is entertainment and singing is so contrary to the gospel. The ultimate object of the gospel is to bring us to a knowledge of the glory of God. That's the first thing. And if we haven't got that knowledge, what we may have is comparatively useless. The glory of God, God the Father, what is it? Well, he's the great creator. He's Jehovah, great I am. We've been singing of him. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The God who said, let there be light. God is the creator of the universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. He's the God of providence. He's the God of history. You can't understand history without God. God's at the back of everything. But the ultimate truth about God is this, is his glory. What's that? It can't be described. It's so marvelous. It includes holiness. It includes absolute righteousness. It includes love. But the essence of God is this glory. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Anybody who's ever had a glimpse of the glory of God falls down at his feet. John had a glimpse of it on the Isle of Patmos. He fell down as one dead. The young Isaiah had a glimpse of it. And he said, Woe is unto me, I'm the man of unclean lips. The glory of God, this eternal light, this blazing holiness, the glory of God. Yes, but if you really want to see the glory of God, you see it in this gospel which is God's wisdom and God's power. I say it with reverence. God's glory is to be seen not even in creation. It's marvelous in creation. Do you see the glory of God as you look at the trees at the present time? And as you look at the bloom on the trees and the flowers, don't you see the glory of God there? Man hasn't produced that. God's manifesting his glory in creation. But that is nothing compared to the wisdom and the power that God has revealed in this plan of salvation. No man could ever have devised it. That's why Paul has said in the first epistle to these Corinthians that the preaching of the cross, which to them that perish is foolishness, stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Greeks. What's it to us? Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's already said, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the Son. What's the glory of the Son? Well, the essential glory of the Son is that he is the express image and likeness of the Father as the author of the epistle to the Hebrews puts it. You know, it's not surprising that Paul says, in the face of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, that's where he saw it, wasn't it? I've reminded you how I saw of Tarsus. He was going down that morning to Damascus to exterminate the Christian church, breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Suddenly he sees a light and a face and a glory. He doesn't know who it is, but he sees the glory. And he says, who art thou, Lord? He realized it was some great transcendent Lord. There was a radiance, there was a glory shining from this blessed face. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou art persecuting. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, my friends, was truly a man. But as so many are saying today, he was only man. It's a lie. He was also truly God. He's co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. 
is the express image and the likeness of the Father himself. This is his essential glory. Yes, but again, if you really want to see and to know the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you must look at him lying in a manger, in a stable in Bethlehem. Do you see the glory there? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead, see. Here is his glory, that to deliver you and me from being lost and from hell, he laid aside the signs of this transcendent glory and was born in the likeness of sinful flesh, came in the form of a servant, was made under the law, born of a woman, entered the world in poverty, worked with his hands, suffered the indignity and the rudeness of men and women, misunderstanding and scorn and rejection, eventually even going to the cross, subjected to temptation in the wilderness, dying on the cross, being buried in a grave. Why? That you and I might be saved. He didn't consider it something to be held on to, to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. Aren't you moved by that glory? Aren't you thrilled by it? Are we just good little people who think we're wonderful because we come to church twice on Sunday or perhaps even once? Shame on you if you do. You are here because you've seen the glory of this person who lays aside the signs of the glory for the time being and endures all this in order that you and I might be saved. Paul says in the next chapter, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Have you seen his glory? Where do you see it? Look at the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, it's wondrous. Why? Because the Prince of Glory died there. The author of life expired on it. That's the glory. That you and I might be saved from being lost and might have eternal glory. The glory of his death and the glory of his resurrection. Aren't you thrilled by it? Aren't you moved by it? These people in Corinth thought philosophy was superior to this kind of thing. What about you? Do you glory in the cross? Do you glory in the resurrection when he burst asunder the bands of death and rose triumphant o'er the grave, ascended unto him, and is seated at the right hand of God in the glory everlasting, and then the glory that is yet to come, when one day he'll come back again, not as Jesus of Nazareth, but as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords, riding the clouds of heaven, he'll come to judge the whole world in righteousness, and we shall see his glory, and every eye shall see his glory, and those foolish people who have rejected him, or dismissed him, or denied him, with their kings and princes, will try cry out into the rocks and to the mountains to hide them from his glory who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then the glory of the Holy Spirit. Where do I find that? Listen, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. I've told you that the problem confronting the preacher is how to deal with the ignorance and the darkness of people, how to get them out of the clutches of the devil, how to enable them to see that they're sinners, that they've got souls, that they've got to meet God in judgment and the fate that awaits them if they don't. How can we do this? How can we convict people of sin? Can any man do it? Of course he can't. It's impossible. Before a man can be convicted of sin, he must have the power of the Holy Ghost. The excellency of the power must be of God and not of man. And so, though the preacher may be a small and a feeble man, if he's filled with the Spirit, there is a power in him that can bring men and women to conviction of sin, can open their eyes, to see their darkness, their lost estate, to give them faith and capacity to believe. That's why Paul says in the first epistle to these people in chapter 2, 
But when he came amongst them, he came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto them the power of God. How then? In demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? Well, it's the only way whereby a man can be saved. It's the spirit alone that can convict us of sin and reveal to us the glory of Christ, the meaning of his death as our substitute and all that belongs to the Christian message. And the glory of the Spirit is this, that though he is equal to the Father and to the Son, he has made himself subservient to them, and they have both sent him to the church in order to bring to us the salvation that the Father planned, the Son came to execute, and which the Spirit alone can explain and expound to us with power. Very well, there you see the glory of this message. This is why I don't preach myself, says Paul. Fancy a man calling attention to himself, going onto a pul into a pulpit or on a platform, cracking a few jokes to make people laugh, trying to wheedle them, entertaining them by singing or by dancing or by drama or miming, instead of preaching this glorious gospel. The glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, the glory of the Holy Ghost, and the glory that comes to us as the result of believing this. What is it? Free pardon and forgiveness. Do you realize what that means? All your sins blotted out like a thick cloud. Not only that, you are born again. Men and women can only believe this when they are born again. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He's got to become a spiritual man. Can any preacher recreate a soul? Of course he can't. But the Spirit can. Born again of the Spirit. Made children of God. Adopted into God's family. We can pray to God daily with assurance. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. See the streams of living waters flowing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove. This is what enables a man to say, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, the glory of this great salvation. My dear people, have you seen it? Are we giving the impression to the world that is outside, in our preaching from pulpits, in our daily lives and living, that we are possessors of this glorious gospel, which has given us a glimpse of the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, and the glory of the Holy Ghost, and which makes us, in turn, rejoice in hope, of the glory of God. This is a passing world. It's an earthen vessel world. If a third world war comes, it's the end of the civilization. It's the end of the world as we've known it. And there are men today saying that who are not Christians at all. Is that the end? Is there no hope? Not at all. We have an inheritance, says Peter, which is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us by God. Let them let off all their atomic bombs at the same time. Let hell be set loose. Nothing can separate us who believe this glorious gospel from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The business of the ministry and of preaching is to make known that glory and every church member is to make the same glory known and that's why if you see this you won't go in for ministers who've got a long string of academic qualifications you'll seek men who are filled with the spirit and of power men who are prepared to be nothing that the glory of God may be everything so you're all involved in this and our responsibility is tremendous. 
But the moment you see that the real task is the condition of men and women as they are by nature, you realize that man can't do it. And then, you know, you begin to pray for revival. Are you praying for revival? Do you pray every Sunday that the Spirit of God may come down upon your preachers? Are you praying for an outpouring of the Spirit of God? If you're not, it's because you haven't realized the task confronting us of men and women in darkness, blinded by the God of this world, under the dominion of Satan, and going to a lost eternity. Nothing but the Spirit and His power, the excellency of this power, can possibly save them. So we're all on test. The more you realize the problem, the more you will pray without ceasing for an outpouring of the Spirit of God upon every preacher of the gospel, and you'll go on doing so until God in his grace hears us and deigns to visit us again. May he continue to bless our two brothers more and more abundantly, but may he make of all of us intercessors for a lost world ere it be too late. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we pray that thou dost have mercy upon us. We are so much influenced by the mind and the thinking of this present world. We confess that so often we fail to realize the depth of the problem and also the excellency of the power and the glory of the gospel. Lord, open all our eyes and bring us to this realization and then authenticate our message by sending thy spirit upon us in a mighty awakening that will shake us and shake the world to thine everlasting glory. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.